Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. This is Pint Glass Football, drink beer, talk NFL and college football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler, and McKenzie Brewing is the official beer of Pint Glass Football. Follow them at McKenzie Brewing. Follow us at pintglassfootball.com. If you're new to the show, hit that subscribe button. What's up, PGF Nation? The NFL draft is in the books, but now the real fun begins. We're going to give you some of our biggest takeaways from this draft, some of the latest NFL news, and we're going to start by grading each team's draft class one division at a time. Since the Panthers kicked off the draft, we're going to start with the NFC South today. But joining me to do so, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, what's going on? Hey, Brad. I mean, you know, we were speaking in... I happen to be out of town. This is the first time I can ever remember me being out of town for the draft. Usually for the draft, I lock in, I grow some wings, and it's leave me alone. This is going. This is my mecca. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And I was gone from Thursday to Sunday, so I actually, outside of a couple of alerts in the first round, I kind of did not see anything that happened with the draft. Until I came back. So I'm happy to jump back in. I'm happy that I got the wheels turning and got back into the enjoy vacation for sure. But going into the draft and finding out what my team picked, because I had no idea what the Raiders picked at all. And then seeing what everybody else picked and now diving back in division by division and breaking it down. Yeah, man, you sent me a video a text and it looked like you were staying in a pretty nice place in Orlando. Palm trees, cold drinks, looked like a good time. Absolutely. Driving the golf cart that I probably shouldn't have been, but that's another story. (laughs) Oh, man. Happy to have you back. Happy to jump back in it. Man, the NFL draft was so much fun. My goodness. I love this event. It's so awesome every year. Can't wait to dive into it. But like always, got some NFL news that we need to touch on here. Because it seems like a week goes by and it feels like a month because there's always so much news around the football world that we got to get into. A story that we've been following, everyone's been following, got to get some quick thoughts on it here. It's finally a done deal. Aaron Rodgers is a New York Jet. ESPN first reported that the Jets will receive Aaron Rodgers, the number 15 overall pick, and a fifth-round pick in 2023. The Packers ended up getting the 13th overall pick, a second-round pick, and a sixth-round pick this year, and a conditional 2024 second-round pick that becomes a first-rounder if Rodgers plays 65% of the plays during the upcoming season. This is a franchise, as we know, They've, they've got a lot of momentum, but they had that big glaring hole at quarterback. They finally get the deal done to get Aaron Rodgers. What are your thoughts on him and his fit in New York? I love him being in New York. I think he has the temperament, as a New Yorker, I'm saying this. I think he has the temperament to deal with New York and have the ability not to care as much about the media and be able to move on. I mean, it still remains to be seen, but I think he does. That's about the fit for the city, if you know anything about or heard anything, regardless of sport, about New York media. The second thing is with the team. Now here's the part where we're going to watch and see how this offseason goes. Is he dialed in? Is he doing the little things like, hey, let me bring the receivers out to wherever he's living now and saying, hey, let's throw the ball around a little bit. Let's let Alan Lazard show you guys. They kept Corey Davis as of now. They still have him. So that's a very full and very talented wide receiver room at the moment. So I think if we watch him dial in and get in with those receivers, I think from there we'll be able to say, hmm, because if I'm not mistaken, they are now at a nine and a half. I'm not a betting man, but I believe their their spread is nine and a half over under is nine and a half wins. Yeah, it certainly changes things for New York. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And just to put it in perspective, that New York fan base, that market, and how big it is for this team, Aaron Rodgers. All the things he's been able to do in his career, the MVPs, the Super Bowl championship. This is a guy who's had 4,000 plus passing yards in 10 seasons throughout his career. To put that in perspective, Alex, the Jets as a franchise have had one. And that was Joe Namath all the way back in 1967. So this is a franchise that is starving for a star quarterback. Now, last year was a down year for Rodgers by his standards. But this is a guy who still threw for almost 3,700 yards, 26 touchdowns, 
12 interceptions. So he can still play at a pretty high level here, even at age 39. Now, the Jets have missed the playoffs 12 straight years. That's the longest streak in the NFL. But we know that this team is young. They've hit on a lot of draft picks. They've got some momentum here. He could be the missing piece. But here's the real question, and let's uh, let's just face it. This is the biggest question here now that Aaron Rodgers is in New York. Does he make them a Super Bowl contender? My answer, my answer to that is it puts them in that small bubble of contenders that we're talking about. With that defense, if they can match, and we only go know what we saw last year, if they can match that intensity and the physicalness that they had last year, along with Aaron Rodgers, he won't be asked to do much. He won't be asked to do anything extraordinary all of the time. He can sit back and really hand that ball off to Brees Hall and close out games as opposed to maybe throwing up Hail Marys or having to close out anything all of the time. Not that he had to do that much in Green Bay, but there was a lot that was put on him. Here, there's a running game. There's a defense. You're not going to have to do a whole lot, but we're going to actually convert some third downs and maybe once or twice make a spectacular play to get us out of something as it is a competitive game. Given that defense, we would just have to give them the benefit of the doubt and putting them in the Super Bowl bubble. And I can't wait till we start to do picks because I know you've heard one of my takes. So I can't wait to bring that up when we start to go down where we look at these divisions lining up. Yeah, you're right. I think it puts them in the Super Bowl conversation. I'm a little hesitant to say full-blown contender, but I think if he plays at a high enough level, like I think he still can, and you hit on it with a strong running game and a strong defense, He doesn't need to be MVP level Aaron Rodgers. He needs to be Pro Bowl Aaron Rodgers. He just needs to be a good, solid starting quarterback, a top 12 quarterback. And I think he can easily do that even at age 39. I asked PGF Nation on Twitter what they thought at PGF Podcast. Does this make the Jets a Super Bowl contender? A little surprised by the results. 68% said no. Only 32% said yes. When you look at Vegas, the Jets' Super Bowl odds have swung after signing Rodgers, or trading for Rodgers, I should say, from plus 2,500 back in February to now plus 1,400. That's according to sportsbettingdime.com. So clearly Vegas is has moved the odds in a huge way. I think if the Jets were in the NFC, they would be a lock no-brainer contender for Absolutely. the Super Bowl. I think the one thing that makes this a little tougher is just all the landmines that you have to get through in the AFC makes it a tougher task to reach the ultimate goal. But man, it makes it a lot of fun next season. This is going to be a great story to watch. This is going to be a really fun team to pay attention to. Speaking of MVP quarterbacks, though, another story that we've been following here and we got to follow up on because Lamar Jackson gets a deal done. He's agreed to a five-year, $260 million extension, $185 million guaranteed with the Baltimore Ravens. Jackson didn't get the fully guaranteed deal that he reportedly wanted, but this does make him the highest paid player in the NFL with $52 million a year. Now, reports have come out and said that he rejected a five-year, $250 million offer last August, which would have paid out $133 million fully guaranteed at signing. So he didn't maybe get the, the numbers he wanted originally, Alex, but he still gets a big-time lucrative deal. What does this mean for Jackson? What does this mean for the Ravens going forward? Well, I'll tell you the first thing that it told me. It told me that my first instincts were right all along. And anytime I spoke about this situation, I said, I just don't believe that he wants a fully guaranteed contract. I don't believe he ever wanted a fully guaranteed contract. I believe that he wanted them to show him a commitment to the offensive side of the ball. I think the first step was moving moving on from Greg Roman, moving on from him and, gra- and getting the uh, Georgia OC and then going and getting a name player. I'm not sure if he's the same player in skill set, but a name player in OBJ, I love it because they not only did that, they also drafted Zay Flowers. So now you have OBJ on the outside. You have Bateman. You have DuVernay, uh, Mark Andrews. And now you have Zay Flowers in the fold as well. That gives him a – that probably takes him out of the bottom end of wide receiver – in the wide receiver room in terms of talent. And now he's working with some talent. And finally, we will get to see him to put to rest this narrative that he needs wide receivers – but I'm happy he got the deal done. I never believed he wanted a fully guaranteed contract. 260, 185 makes him the highest paid, new highest paid play, not only quarterback, but paid player 
in the league, so good for him. Looking forward to see what Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert get after this. Speaking of contracts, I think the Jackson situation here could make teams really start to think differently about using the exclusive franchise tag in the future because the non-exclusive tag allowed teams to negotiate with Lamar and sign him to an offer sheet with the Ravens landing two first-round picks if they chose not to match. The exclusive franchise tag would have prevented teams from even negotiating with Jackson. But in typical Ravens fashion, they handle this situation perfectly because if any team was going to make a significant offer, they'd risk shipping off two first-round picks to land a 26-year-old former MVP. But nobody was willing to make that offer, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. I I think this, I don't want to say tactic, but this term is usually is more used on the NBA side where they'll let a player hit they're like a restricted free agent and allow them to go seek another deal. And then they have the option to match or not, which this is very odd for a player of Lamar's caliber to get that type of tag. So that's the first thing. So I think you will see teams say, Hmm, you know what? We think of a number, but let's put you out there on the market. And if they go for a number, what we want to keep you, we'll match it. And if not, we'll let you go and get our picks and move forward. So yeah, I, I agree with you that I think we'll start to see this used a lot more in the future. Some other news I want to get to here before we jump into the draft. The Kansas City Chiefs have re-signed running back Jarek McKinnon and decided to decline former first-round pick Clyde Edward Hilaire's option. Not a huge surprise here. He never really had a consistent presence in Kansas City. And also, after hitting on Isaiah Pacheco in the seventh round last year, the running back room is crowded, and it just felt like he became expendable to the Kansas City Chiefs. Absolutely. They drafted him at the back end of the first round, neglected to stay healthy. He did help them go through that first Super Bowl run where he got healthy at the end. But then since then, he's been inconsistent in and out of the lineup. And when they also signed, excuse me, as you said, they re-signed Jarek McKinnon. Isaiah Pacheco was a stud. We all talked about he should have had way more yards rushing in the Super Bowl than he actually did. And with their hit rate and what the running back position is, it did make him expendable. I don't see, I just see the Chiefs moving on without Clyde Edwards Hilaire. As we saw DeAndre Swift traded, it's interesting to see if anybody will trade for Clyde or if they'll just wait for him to hit the market. Yeah, talented guy, definitely has a skill set that a lot of teams are going to covet. But the injury concerns and the lack of production and just the fact that running backs have really become a dime a dozen position anymore, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with him and his career moving forward. But like I said, the Chiefs decide to move on. The Jets are also going to move on from Makai Becton, a guy who was a first round pick, a highly coveted offensive tackle, a big time talent. And a guy that really showed a ton of promise when he was on the field, but similar to Clyde Edwards Alaire, just too many injuries, too inconsistent, and they've decided to move on from Makai Becton. Yeah, I don't have an issue here. Again, similar to Clyde Edwards Alaire, except Makai has been more injured, unfortunately, throughout his career. I mean, 6'8, about 370 pounds, you know, out of Louisville. I had high hopes for him. I know we talked about it. We had high hopes for him. And then when he does play, it looks really good. But then something always happens. Unfortunately, something always happens. And then he's out. He's not only out for a few games. He ends up being out for the season. And at that left tackle position, this is something that you just simply cannot have. Hopefully, he's able to find a home somewhere where he can get himself healthy and work him back into the form that we always thought he would be in this league. Yeah, for sure, because I was really high on this guy coming out of the draft. I had incredibly high grades on him. Unfortunately, the injuries just kept him from being able to put it all together consistently. The most shocking declined option that I've seen here, Alex, though, is the Arizona Cardinals decline the option for linebacker slash safety slash cornerback slash do-it-all player, former number eight overall pick Isaiah Simmons. I honestly don't know what to say here. I I, I am befuddled. (laughs) You know, I don't know what the Cardinals are doing, but at the same time, when we look at how that organization has been run over the past few years, I know what the Cardinals are doing. And we spoke about it before we, and we'll just call it pre-production. We all had the same sentiment. Wait till Bill Belichick gets his hands on this guy. It's just going to be 
amazing. Like you said, this guy can play outside linebacker, middle linebacker, safety, corner, whatever it is. You literally do not have to take this man off the off of the field. 6'4", 238, if I'm not mistaken, he ran a 4'3840. High, high production at Clemson, tackles for loss, sacks, interceptions, put everything on display. This guy has an incredible skill set, and it's amazing that that organization could not figure out how to utilize him and maximize those skill sets. They, they simply could not put it together. And I'm, I just don't understand. It's absolutely shocking. And you're right because he is the perfect candidate for a guy like Bill Belichick. He just feels like a Bill Belichick type of defensive player. Bill Belichick is a guy who loves versatile players. This guy, you could argue, might be the most versatile defender in the entire NFL. He played in all 17 games last year, 99 tackles, four sacks, two forced fumbles, two interceptions, a fumble recovery, a batted pass, and a touchdown, eight pass breakups. I mean, what can't this guy do on the field? He lined up at cornerback, outside linebacker, inside linebacker, safety. He even played on the defensive line. It's ridiculous how many different things this guy can offer a defense. And with his skill set and his ability for the Cardinals to basically let this guy walk after this season is just shocking to me. I I hope he ends up in a place like New England, a place with a better culture, a better coaching staff, and some place that can really utilize him and he can become the player that we all thought he would be, which is a perennial Pro Bowl, all pro type of defender. Absolutely. I mean, I can't wait to see where this guy goes. I hope that he does. If he doesn't go to Patriots, I hope he ends up, you know, in the Vic Fangio type situation where somebody will just know how to utilize him because I'm pretty sure he starved to unleash on the league what we always what we all saw at Clemson. Yeah, Vic Fangio, great fit. I'd love to see what a guy like D'Amico Ryans in Houston could do with him. Wow. You know, Mike Tomlin in Pittsburgh. There's a lot of names that kind of jump into my school here just outside of Belichick, but I'm going to be excited to kind of see where he goes here because, look, I'm not rooting against the Cardinals or anything like that, but this franchise just hasn't been very well run. For the last several years now, they've really had a hard time being able to put together a consistent winner, to be able to put together a consistent culture. It's unfortunate when you see a guy with this much talent kind of get wasted in a bad franchise in a bad situation. So I'm definitely pulling for him to find a better home. The popularity of football, the popularity of the NFL, it just continues to dominate the sports landscape, Alex. And this year's draft is just further proof. There was approximately 12 million TV viewers on three different networks just for the first round alone of this year's NFL draft, more than 300,000 fans were in attendance in Kansas City. Just to put that in perspective, the NBA averaged 1.5 million viewers per nationally televised regular season games this year. Those are regular season NBA games. At the draft, no football was actually played, yet 12 million people tuned in to watch Roger Goodell read names at a podium. This is how huge the sport of football has become in this country, and it's seriously amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't had a chance, I've gone to the draft as a New Yorker. I've been to Radio City Music Hall several times. But now that they've moved it, and now it's it's now an event. Wherever, wherever Whatever city they hold it in, it now, be, now becomes an event. It's almost a Super Bowl-style production they put on in terms of, the entertainment in terms of the location, everything is set up perfectly, like almost like a Coachella size t- type of vibe. When I watch it, just when I'm watching on TV, I was like, this feels like a one of the Woodstocks or the uh, Coachella type events that are put on by big production companies with entertainment. They bring in all type of entertainment from all around to entertain everyone. So you're not just there watching people be called and brought on the stage, but you're also getting an entire show. So you don't feel like you wasted your money if you just say, hey, let's go, let's go to Kansas City for the weekend. It makes sense. It's worth the while. It's worth the trip. It's worth the money. I mean, I can see myself if they ever have it in Miami, <laughs> I can see myself making a trip. Man, you're not kidding. It just looks like an absolute blast on TV. Kansas City showed up big. 
I mean, holy crap, 300,000 people. It was crazy to see that many people at an NFL draft. I absolutely loved it, Alex. It's just a huge party. Everyone's dressed up, having fun, drinking cold beers. Like you said, they've got music acts. They've got celebrities. It, it's just a, it's really amazing what the NFL has done and how they've grown this into such a huge event. But let's get into the football part of it. I, I want to mostly focus on the first round here, but I just kind of want to get some of your big takeaways. What kind of stood out, good and bad, in this NFL draft, Alex? Well, I'll go right to the number eighth and the number 12th pick. And the only reason I'm naming number eight is because I did not expect Bijan Robin. I don't believe we mocked him this high. And I didn't expect then at number 12 for Detroit to go and get Jameer Gibbs. I don't believe we mocked him anywhere in the first round, if I'm not mistaken. We figured he would fall and keep to the trend of, you know, maybe there's this one guy, Bijan being that one guy, picked in the first round and maybe towards the back end or maybe the top end of the second round we would see him taken. But he went 12th. That was the number one thing that stood out to me. Well, objectively, because you know how I feel about my Raiders pick. But <laughs> the, the, the B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs getting picked in the top 15 was very surprising. Not so much B. John Robinson, but Jameer Gibbs definitely blew me away. Yeah, I'm completely with you here. We're doing the NFC South draft grades here. So I'm going to talk about the B. John Robinson pick a little more in depth here later. But I do want to talk about what you mentioned there with Jameer Gibbs. Detroit sent the number six pick to Arizona for pick number 12 and number 34. Now, look, I'm I'm usually a fan of teams trading back in the draft and getting more picks. But the Lions traded out of six to move to 12 and then selected Jameer Gibbs, the running back from Alabama. Uh, and look, he's a solid prospect. I, I think he's going to be a good player in this league. But if the Lions were clearly targeting running back earlier in this draft, why wouldn't they just stay at six and take B. John Robinson, who's right. easily the best running back in this draft, easily the best running back prospect in this class, and probably the best running back prospect since Saquon Barkley. As we go through this process, it'll come out from whether it comes out from Schefter, Rappaport, or maybe the internal Lions beat writers. What happened? Who mis Somebody misjudged. To me, somebody misjudged something here, and it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know why. To your point, why did you move from 6 back to 12? Somebody misjudged something here. They they had to think that Bijan was going to be there and... I maybe Atlanta surprised. I was surprised by that pick, but maybe Atlanta surprised them that they weren't expecting that. But somewhere along the line here, somebody misjudged something because this did not make any sense. Didn't like the strategy there at yeah, all absolutely. by Detroit. Absolutely, and and as we when we get to the uh, NFC North, I'll I think we'll both expound upon who they passed on to get Jameer Gibbs, but we'll save that for the NFC North when we cover the NFC North. Yeah, no doubt about it. And another. I think really fascinating move in this draft that everyone's talking about, and rightfully so, the Houston Texans trading with the Arizona Cardinals to make back-to-back -back picks at number two and number three. They moved up to draft Will Anderson Jr. from Alabama. I didn't like this move at all, Alex. I, I just didn't like this move for the Texans. The Texans have a lot of holes to fill on this roster. It's a rebuilding team, and using draft capital, a lot of draft capital, to move up for Anderson just didn't make sense to me at all. I mean, he's a good player. I, I like Will Anderson. I think he's a really solid prospect, but I don't think he's a Von Miller, Miles Garrett, TJ Watt type of talent. I, I just don't see that level of talent when I look at his tape. I think he instantly improves this defense, and I get that. They need playmakers on that side of the ball but not enough for that price. Houston traded the number 12 pick, the 33rd pick, and a 2024 first rounder and third rounder to the Arizona Cardinals for the number three pick and the number 105 pick. Yeah, I didn't understand this move. I, I, with you, I didn't have that high of a grade on him either. Obviously, somebody in that room, probably D'Amico Ryans and the brain trust is there, but, you know, despite what we believe and what we see, their scouts and their coaching staff believes that he is that difference maker because this is the only reason you make a move of this caliber. I mean, 
<laughs> this is madness to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is. This is madness to me. These are the only things you do in Madden. You don't do these things. And we really, I don't even think, I can't even recall the last time we've seen anything like this where not only back to back, but back to back at two and three with the, again, to your point, the amount of draft capital that they gave up. I just don't see him projecting that high. And, but obviously that coaching staff and that scouting department sees something completely different because you don't make a move like this unless you're rock solid confident that this guy is going to work. And if it doesn't, somebody's head is going to be on a chopping block. I'm sorry. I, 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 if I, as a CEO of that team, I'm going to have a lot of questions on why we made this move and why this person did not work out. I couldn't agree more. I think he's an eight sack type of guy, maybe an eight, nine sacks a year type of guy. I just don't ever see him being a 12 and a half, 13 sack a year guy. And those are the type of players that you make this kind of move for uh, an elite edge defender. Like, like I mentioned, some of the names, a Miles Garrett type of prospect, a Von Miller type of prospect. You don't make a move for a guy that is just really, really solid. And I think that's what Will Anderson is, just really, really solid. I just don't see an elite talent. I, and like I said, they gave up a lot to move up for him. Wasn't a fan of that. And you're right. He's going to be an interesting player to follow in his early part of his career and kind of see if it all works out for them. Now, probably the biggest storyline in this NFL draft, Will Levis falling out of the first round. This was shocking, not just to me, to a lot of people. Now, he's a boomer bust prospect. We've talked about him. We've broke down his game. He's got parts of his game that need to be cleaned up. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I think the reports that have come out about him bombing interviews with teams, I think that has a lot more to do with this slide in the NFL draft than the actual player itself. Because a guy with that size, arm strength, and a guy that was viewed as a top five pick after his junior year falls into the second round, it's head scratching. I mean, he has NFL tools. He played in an NFL style offense. I don't know, Alex. I mean, maybe an experience like this humbles a guy like Will Levis and he uses it as fuel to work on his game. The Titans pick him up in the second round. They they moved up to get him. They're clearly ready to move off of Ryan Tannehill. This is two straight drafts where they took a quarterback in the first three rounds. I think Will Levis will be starting in Tennessee before the season's over. Yeah, I, I happen to agree with that. However, structurally, I don't see, uh, and I think I said this on the last podcast, the, the Titans are trending towards a rebuild, a complete rebuild. So everything that he's going to know this year, I don't believe is going to be there anymore. I don't believe the head coach is going to be there. I don't believe any of the coaches are going to be there. So to me, this is unfortunately, whether I believe in the, in the player or not, this is going to be a lost year for him because I think this th he will not be with this staff coming in. And this is a guy to me, as you know, I had him fifth behind Anthony Richardson and um, I had um, Hendon Hooker rated ahead of him. But I just don't think the infrastructure is there. I don't think his maturity is there. I, I just don't know structurally what the plan is. I always like to see, okay, I see what the plan is. I see where you're trending to and to Get Malik Willis last year in the third round, and now you go again in this in the next year, and you go and you get Will Levis. I just don't I don't know what the plan is. Not saying that Malik Willis was going to be the next quarterback in waiting, but I just don't see what the plan is here. Especially when I believe you've already moved on from the GM. The head coach is talking like he doesn't want to be there. You're looking like you're not going to keep the head coach. What is the plan here? And it's it's you know it's looking very cardinalish. Sorry, but it is, and and that's not. What I'm used to the Titans being, they've usually been rock solid, making great picks and being very competitive. But I don't know where the Titans are headed. And it doesn't, the next three to four years do not look like they're going to be fun in Tennessee. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's a great fit either. And, and for Will Levis, I don't think it's a very good situation. A lot of times when a quarterback that's viewed as a top 10 type of pick, a top three or four quarterback in his class, when a guy like that slides, a lot of times it can actually benefit a young quarterback because they end up going to a better franchise and they end up going to a more stable franchise with better coaching. Now, Mike Vrabel's a good coach. And like you said, this franchise has had a decent amount of success in the last couple of years, but it feels like it's a little bit unraveling here. And you're right. If they if this whole thing implodes in the next season, he's going to be in a really bad situation trying to develop under a new coach, new coordinator, new system. I think the Titans saw that draft board in the second round. They saw the Rams sitting there 
knowing that that would have been a really good landing spot for him. And they jumped ahead of him for the sake of NFL football and just being a fan of the shield. I would have really have loved to seen him fall to the Rams in the second round because him and that McVay offense sitting behind Stafford for a year, maybe two would have been a much better situation. Hey, PGF Nation, are you tired of the same old bland food at your tailgate parties? Well, let me tell you about my friends at the Tailgate Foodie, the seasoning and barbecue sauce company that specializes in elevating your tailgate and backyard cooking game. With their unique blend of spices and sauces, the Tailgate Foodie will take your taste buds on a flavor journey that you won't forget. Use code PINTGLASSFOODIE for 15% off your first order at the tailgatefoodie.com. Zencaster is the ultimate web-based podcasting solution. It provides high-quality audio and video podcast production and hosting. With a full suite of professional tools, podcasters can seamlessly record, produce, and publish studio-quality content all from one dashboard. Zencaster's post-production process takes the headache out of audio production. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with a click of a button. Coordinating all your guests to record in person is painful and tedious. Easily invite up to 11 participants per recording with one click. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code PGFP, and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Hey there, PGF Nation. You know what's important when you're having a good time? Staying hydrated. And that's where Liquid IV comes in, the category-winning hydration brand that's fueling your well-being. With just one stick of Liquid IV, you get two times faster hydration than water alone, plus five essential vitamins to keep you feeling your best. And let's not forget about the convenience factor. The packaging is perfect for on the go, whether you're tailgating or just hanging out on the couch. But what really sets Liquid IV apart is the amazing flavors. Personally, I'm all about the Concord grape and lemon lime. And with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, Liquid IV is made with premium ingredients to give you the hydration and nourishment you need. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code PGFP at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code PGFP at liquidiv.com. So next time you're cracking open a cold one and settling in for the big game, make sure you've got Liquid IV by your side. Trust me, your body will thank you. Speaking of quarterbacks, Alex, through five rounds of the NFL draft, a record 12 quarterbacks were selected. That is the most in the common draft era. I think this is the Brock Purdy effect from last year and teams realizing that you can find talented play callers in the later rounds and nobody wants to miss out on the next Brock Purdy, so to speak. Ironically enough, I made a pick who I thought was the Brock Purdy of this draft and Aiden O'Connell, and, and he got drafted by the Raiders. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but yeah, I, I can completely agree. People are saying we have to, looks like somebody at the top of all these organizations said, hey, why did we miss on Brock Purdy? And there was an emphasis put on making sure they vetted all of these quarterbacks out. And some of them I, I I'm, I'm going probably got overdrafted because of that. But I like the fact that people are paying attention about quarterbacks and waiting the backup quarterback position and then development, because that's something that's kind of been, as we've seen the running back position get moved out of the first round, development of quarterbacks has kind of been stagnated a little bit because these guys that are coming in because of the elite seven on sevens and the 11 on on all the camps, these guys come in a lot more ready to go and a lot more of the organizations have been impatient as well as the fan bases. So now with you getting these quarterbacks early on, with a lot of them going to establish teams already, you get to develop and find out if you have a guy or not. And I, and I like getting back to that. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And you're right, because I think a lot of it comes back to, like you said, the seven on seven drills, the guys playing football year round now with these summer leagues. And just the fact that college football has really shifted in the last 15 years or so, where now high profile four and five star recruits are often starters as freshmen, where a couple of decades ago, that really wasn't the case. A lot of guys had to sit, kind of wait their turn, maybe start their junior, senior year, and then move on to the NFL. These guys are getting a lot more snaps, a lot more throws. Because of that, there's been a lot less patience and a lot less development going on at the NFL level. And because of a guy like Brock Purdy being a huge hit in the seventh round, teams are instantly reacting to that. This is a reaction league. The NFL always tends to react to whatever the trend is, and it was in full effect in this NFL draft. Another note here I'd written down that I thought was interesting, speaking of college football, the SEC still led all conferences again this year with the most players selected. That's not a surprise. We know this is the best conference in college football, but the Big Ten led all conferences with 20 players taken in the first two rounds of this draft. I think they're closing the gap here a little bit with the big bad SEC, Alex. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to watch. And I think with UCLA and USC going to the Big Ten in the next two years, and then you also have Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC, it's going to be an arms race <laughs> in terms of the draft. Where, where, who, Which one of these conferences is going to be putting more players into the league? It's going to be fun to watch. I mean, because we all know the SEC, I've always run around saying, you your favorite player is from the SEC for the most part. But times are changing, and that Big Ten is really putting out a lot of players. No doubt about it, man. Speaking of players here, let's kick off these NFL draft grades. NFC South, the Carolina Panthers traded up to the number one pick. They kicked off the draft, so we're going to kick off the draft grades with the NFC South. Alex, why don't you start it off? Okay, I I wanted to be fair to the Panthers with the trade that they made because when you make a trade of that stature, you're for specifically for a quarterback, you're saying this is the guy that's going to quote unquote save our franchise. We know they've been depleted at wide receiver making that trade. DJ Moore to, goes over to Chicago as well. We know the running back situation. They let Christian McCaffrey they traded excuse me, traded Christian McCaffrey over to San Francisco. They brought in Miles Sanders. So now and you know I love their head coach. I love Frank Reich in terms of development of a quarterback. Bryce Young as we if you've been listening to this podcast, we mocked him as our number one over CJ Stroud. There was a lot of talk about taking a guy with the height Weight advantage, no. Bryce Young was the better quarterback, so I thought they got the the pick right there. When we start to go through the rest of the, excuse me, the rest of their draft, it leaves a lot to be desired. Play, I'll say solid players in terms of my projections out. But Jonathan Mingo, hopefully he's you know he he does have the size. He's about six two, two hundred and fifteen pounds, if I'm not mistaken. DJ Johnson out of Oregon, decent outside linebacker. I'm not sure about how high of an output that we'll get for him. And then you get into the fourth and fifth rounds with Jamie Robinson, excuse me, with Chandler Zavala, if I'm saying that correctly, and then Jamie Robinson, respectfully, in, in order. I'm just a little worried. They did do a lot of work on defense, so they hit on defense you know, about two drafts ago when they went all defense. But in terms of weapons and things they need to do for Bryce Young, Especially offensive line. I thought a couple. I thought in the second round I would have gone offensive line there because they, there's just a lot to be desired on the offensive line. So as of right now, I'm going to give them a B minus because I do believe in Bryce Young so much that I, they got that pick right, and I'm just going to wait the first round pick a little bit heavier than the rest of the picks. But I'm going to give them. I'm going to give them a B minus on their on their draft, and hopefully we get to see a little bit more as they things round out. Of course, we can always be wrong, but that's just my projection. What I see. Yeah, Alex, I think it's a good grade. I think it's a solid grade, and I think you're very fair with the way you evaluated it. And for people that might be new to the show and haven't tuned into the draft coverage that we've done here at Pint Glass Football over the years, the grade is definitely weighted more towards the first, second, third round picks because once you kind of get past those first couple picks, the chances of guys in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round being a high-level player, a starter, or heck, when you get in the later rounds, even making the team, it becomes really hard to predict those guys. Now, if there's a guy later in the draft of some of these teams that we really liked or thought was a good value, we'll point those out, of course. But we're, we're putting most of the weight here on those early picks because that's really going to make up the bulk of 
what you got out of this draft class. Those are the guys that you expect to be high level players that you expect to be key contributors to your football team going forward. You know, Alex, you kind of touched on that. That's what we're putting the most of our grade on here. And, and I, and I'm with you here, Uh, Bryce young, it's kind of an easy, no brainer slam dunk. Now, granted, there were a lot of people that like C.J. Stroud. There was a lot of media noise early on that thought C.J. Stroud might go number one. I I started to buy into it. I thought originally he could go number one, even though we both had Bryce Young graded as the better quarterback. They made the right choice, though. Size, we know that's the big question mark, but the kid can spin it. He's got all the right tools that you're looking for. And as long as they can protect him and he can stay healthy, I think he's going to be a good player in this league. Now, Jonathan Mingo in the second round, He was on my list of my favorite sleepers. I say that because I did not expect him to go this high. And and this is coming from somebody who really likes Jonathan Mingo. I thought he was more of a third round pick. The draft buzz for him seemed to be kind of building before the draft. So I guess it's not a complete shock that he went number 39 overall, but a really good player and a big physical player at 6'2", 220, great athlete needs to polish up some parts of his game, but I like that you go and get your young quarterback a big athletic target right off the bat. So I I like that pick. I'm with you though. Offensive line probably could have got better value there, but there wasn't a lot of big athletic wide receivers in this class. And so maybe they felt like, hey, we're not going to get a guy with this size and skill set later in the draft. So I kind of understand that. Now, DJ Johnson is a guy that I'm familiar with out of Oregon. Of course, I'm out here in the Northwest, so I know him a little better than most guys. And look, I like DJ, but even I didn't think he was a third round pick. I think this was a little bit of a reach. I thought he was more of a fourth or fifth round type of talent. So don't love that where they took him. I like the player. but I think you could have found better value there. I think overall, it's a really fair grade, though, Alex. All right, I'm going to jump into the Atlanta Falcons here. Now, we kind of touched on this here a minute ago, but the most shocking pick in the first 10 picks, I think easily in this draft, were the Atlanta Falcons at eight, taking Texas running back B. John Robinson. Now, look, he's a great player, and he's probably a top five prospect in this entire class. But this team came into this draft with holes at a lot of other positions, And quite frankly, running back wasn't one of them. They needed help at corner, defensive end, defensive tackle. They could have used a wide receiver. When you look at the players that were still on the board at eight, Alex, Christian Gonzalez was available. Jalen Carter was available, which, look, I get the character concerns. Maybe that scared them away. I get that. But from a talent standpoint and from a need on the D-line, Lucas Van Ness was still available. Will McDonald was available. I mean, there are a lot of guys here that they could have taken instead of taking the running back. And not only that, but they could have had their choice of any wide receiver in this class. They could have taken the number one wide receiver on their board and gotten another weapon on the outside, a position that I thought they needed more than running back. I just don't understand this pick at all. Now, Bijan could be a thousand yard rusher year one, but this team could already run the ball. I mean, last year's rookie who they got in the fifth round, he rushed for over a thousand yards last year. So going after the running back position, I, I just didn't understand it. I, I didn't like this pick at all. Even though I like Bijan Robinson, I think he's a fantastic player, but to the Falcons at eight, it just didn't make any sense. In, in the second round, they go after Matthew Bergeron, a offensive tackle out of Syracuse. Now, he's a really good player. I thought this was a pretty good pick. He has starting experience at both tackle spots. I think he could move into inside to guard. A lot of analysts think that he projects better as, a, as an offensive guard at the next level. He gets to the second level and can really sustain blocks with linebackers. Plays with an attitude. I really like that about his game. He just wants to destroy the guy in front of him. He's a better run blocker than a pass blocker, but I think his protection issues are something that they can correct with coaching. So I don't think it's a huge red flag. I think he'll get better as time goes on. Big time experience with 39 starts in college at Syracuse. Now, third round pick, Zach Harrison, defensive end out of Ohio State. I don't think we really mentioned him much in any of the pre-draft stuff we did. Only three and a half sacks last season. He's got big time size and length. 
He has some of those physical tools that you look for, but he just wasn't a productive player at Ohio State. He's not that quick off the ball. He gets overpowered too often, and he doesn't have a great motor. It, it looks like he takes plays off, which I, I can't stand. Anytime I see a guy, a big, talented player like this that takes plays off, that's a big concern for me. I think he was really a guy that I think many people saw as a fifth or sixth round pick at best. Taking him in the third, I think, was a huge reach here. This was a really head-scratching pick for me. Now, I really like Clark Phillips, the cornerback that they drafted from Utah. I mean, he was a big-time recruit, transferred from Ohio State to Utah, and developed into one of the best cornerbacks in the nation last year. He reads quarterbacks, attacks the football. He plays with this fiery demeanor that I love. Hard worker, student of the game. All the reports say this guy is a locker room guy. Might not be big enough to line up outside in the NFL at corner, but I do think he's a guy that's going to be a great nickel corner for Atlanta. I'm shocked that he fell to the fourth round. I thought for sure he could be a late second, third round type of guy. So that I thought they got great value with Clark Phillips. Now, Bijan Robinson, like I said, great player. Just not a great pick when there's too many good players on the board at positions of need for Atlanta. Harrison, like I mentioned, huge reach there. Phillips, I think, was a steal, but all in all, I, I left very unimpressed with this draft. I'm going to go with the C minus for the Falcons. Wow, you know, yeah, I, I, at first when you said C minus, but then I was like, wait, they did go B. John Robinson, and we mocked initially. I believe we mocked, uh, well, rather, I mocked Devin Weatherspoon to them, and you're bringing in Jeff Okuda, who's going into his last year when you're going to need, can you imagine if you had put Christian Gonzalez on the other side of AJ Terrell with Jesse Bates in the back, what that would have done for anybody that you would have drafted. If you, let's just say if you stayed the course, you drafted Zach Harrison, what it would have done for somebody like him up front with Grady Jarrett, or what if you would have taken one of the pass rushers like you were speaking to, because that was an absolute, that was an absolute need, you know? So I, I, I can concur with your, with your pick of C minus because the Bijan Robinson, I just I don't get it. I liked the Algiers. I liked Algiers. I thought he only started seven games and had a thousand yards, and he was playing behind Cordell Patterson, who was in a Swiss Army knife in the backfield. So it it was very hard until I believe he got injured, and that's how he got started getting a lot more playing time. But to get playing time from that guy is hard, and he got in, and when he got in, he only started seven games and ended up with a thousand yards. I mean, at 4.9 yards a carry. I mean, this is a guy, these are the things that we talk about with running back when you find them in the later rounds and you get great value. Now you're going with B. John Robinson, Cordell Parrott. Now your backfield is is stacked, but I don't know what's going on with the defense. You still need it. You needed a, you had a lot to desire on defense. And with Derek Carr in that division now, it's going to be, it's going to get a lot more interesting from the Saints standpoint. And you didn't improve a lot on defense. So I agree with your grade. So I know I have the Saints, so we can talk about the Saints. I, <laughs> I let, let me not give away my 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 all my thoughts on what I think about New Orleans right away. I methodically want to go through this. I methodically want to go through this draft and point out a few things. I think every single pick they took was solid. So in other words, I don't think I don't. I'm not sure if anything was a home run, but everything was a single or a double immediately. Brian Brees, Clemson, starter, leader, captain. This guy's huge, 6'6", uh, I believe 305 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. Plug and play player. Put him right, put him right in the middle, and he's going to hopefully cause havoc and help you stop the run. Not the pass rusher that you will want from the middle, but in terms of stuffing the run and being in position and being where he's supposed to be and a person that is a leader and is always in position of where he's supposed to be, I think that's perfect. And I think that's perfect for we always have to connect with what we see teams drafting with who is coaching them. Joe Woods coming over. I think this is a Joe Woods, which is why I like this pick a lot is because I believe this is a Joe Woods type of player. Solid, going to be where he's supposed to be, which leads me into Isaiah Foskey. Hopefully I'm saying his name correctly. Another player, strong at the point of attack. Great with the hands, always in position. Again, like I said, nothing, none of these names are probably going to jump out to you, but everything is, I would say, at least is a double. They just got on base and they kept churning out runs to use a baseball reference no matter what. They always hit 
on each one of these picks. But Isaiah Foskey, so I think what they did there, you know, Cameron Jordan is getting a little bit older. They lost Marcus Davenport. And now you bring in Isaiah Foskey to learn with, along with Cameron Jordan, who's a stalwart at that defensive end position. You, you bring him in who's a student of the game and will learn from them. Now, Kendra Miller, I do have some reserve about this, but he did do a lot of great things at TCU. And we also understand what is going to be happening. Actually, we don't know everything that's going to be happening with uh, with Alvin Kamara, as we know that he's facing uh, that charge and he can be missing some games. So this was a position of need that they needed to fill to bring somebody in to say, hey, if he's not here, let's go and get something in that type of frame and type of production with Kendra Miller. Hopefully they hit again as they hit on Alvin Kamara. I believe they drafted him in the third round as well. Nick <laughs> Saldaveri. Offensive tackle from Old Dominion. Now, there wasn't a lot of tape I could really find on him. So I went a lot to the Senior Bowl. And what I saw from the Senior Bowl was, again, a person that has his hands well. As as we know, sometimes they don't. They allow defenders to get un, get up under the shoulder pads. And once you, you can't do that, maybe you could do that and pull that off at Old Dominion. But you cannot pull that off in the NFL when you're going to be facing the Von Millers, Khalil Max. Aaron Donalds and so forth, because once they get their hands on you up under your pads, you're toast. And there's nothing you can do about it except go backwards. So hopefully they can help him get that technique right. I do like that. I do like that pick. At that, as we know, they lost Terrence Armstead. This is a guy that won't have to start right away, but they'll be able to train up. Again, I would call that a single. Jake Hayner, the Fresno State connection to I kind of I just looked at that and I said, I wonder if Derek Hall was in somebody's ear when this pick came up or if there was a phone call made kind of high for him. But as we said early on that a, a record amount of quarterbacks were taken early on the draft, which we call the Brock Purdy effect of no one wanting to miss out on a guy like that, but also not remembering that that guy also had Kyle Shanahan coaching him as well. But I'm not sure if this is a, this is the guy in waiting. I know I believe that Derek Cardell is only three years Jake Hayner at six feet, 207. I don't know if he's the guy in waiting, but hey, I've always been a proponent of what Bill Belichick has said is, hey, just every year they take a quarterback, every year they take a quarterback, no matter what. And it's also the Green Bay way as well. They would always draft late round quarterbacks and see what they can do. But fourth round was a little high for me. I probably would have liked to go into in a different direction, specifically at linebacker. Because Demario Davis is getting a little bit long in the tooth, and they don't have the strongest of outside linebackers as well. Jordan Hayden and A.T. Perry, the wide receiver out of Wake Forest. Wake Forest actually had a surprising good year, as we all know. But at his size, that this guy reminded me of DJ Chark. Like straight line speed, height, but not a lot of weight in the pants. <laughs> so this is a guy that's a straight line speed that hopefully they'll be able to put on the field and maybe just whenever they need to go long, this is a guy that can go on, that can go ahead and do that. So overall with what I've seen from, especially with the coaches that the new coaches that they brought in to the saints, I'm going to, I'm, I'm te- I was teetering on an a minus, but I'm going to go with a B plus for right now. But I actually, you know what? Let me correct that. I'm going to go with an a minus for the saints. Because like I said, because I think the coaching, the new coaching that they brought in matches the type of players that they drafted, specifically on the defensive side with those first two picks with Joe Woods coming in as the the defensive coordinator. I think he fits that perfectly. So I'm going to go ahead and give them an A minus. Wow. Okay. I'm a little surprised by it. It's a, it's a really good grade. I don't know if it was that good of a class, but I like all the points you made. I don't disagree with any of them. I thought Brian Brissy, the defensive tackle out of Clemson, I thought that was a good spot. Number 29 overall pick. That's about where most people had him late first. Really solid player. I don't know if he's ever going to become you know all pro level player, but I think he's going to be a really solid starter for years to come as long as he can stay healthy. That was really the only big question mark for him. But the tape definitely shows you a guy who can play at a high level. I really like their second round pick. Isaiah Foskey, defensive end out of Notre Dame. This is a guy that can really get off the edge. He's a disruptor, 6'5", 265 pounds, had a nice senior bowl. You mentioned the senior bowl, which I always like 
I always take a lot of value from the senior bowl because you get a chance to see a lot of these guys go against each other. He was also a really productive pass rusher in college, 11 sacks his junior and senior year. I love guys that can produce, not just guys that have traits, but guys that that show up and put up numbers at the college level. The other player that you mentioned that I want to touch on here was Jake Hayner because I think this is an interesting pick. In the fourth round, it might have been a little early. I think I'm with you. He probably would have been available around later. But I understand this pick because this is a guy that I got to see firsthand. I got to see him live when they played Oregon. And you're talking about a Fresno State team, a group of five school, on the road, hostile environment, playing a top 25 level program in Oregon, going up against four and five star players all over the place. And this kid lit it up. And I was really impressed. And by the end of the game, I'm sitting here here going, who is this Jake Hayner guy? Because he was spinning it, man. And, And that really stuck with me. And I remember thinking, boy, this guy's got a lot of talent. And he was really flying under the radar at the time. They might have found something with him late. He's a name to kind of circle and just remember because he's a guy that I think in the fourth round actually could end up being maybe, just maybe, could end up being a really good value pick down the road. I think they just hit a lot of doubles in this draft. It feels like they just had a lot of really solid picks. It felt like every pick made a lot of sense. They addressed that defensive line, like you mentioned, because they were they needed some youth up front. And, and I like what the Saints did too. Maybe, maybe I'm talking myself into it, Alex. I think I'm with you. Maybe an A- minus is the right grade because this was a really solid draft by Mickey Loomis and the Saints. All right, let's wrap it up with the Tampa Bay Bucks. Now, they took Kalijah Cansey at number 19 overall in this draft. Undersized defensive tackle, but this is a guy who has elite quickness off the ball. I mean, can really get off the snap. Had seven and a half sacks last season at Pittsburgh. I do worry about the size and his shorter arms, but the talent is obvious. When you watch his tape, it really pops. Now, he should make an immediate impact as a pass rusher for this defense, a guy who can get up the field. I think they can slot him into the three technique to be an up-the-field attacking defensive tackle. Tampa really needed help up front, and a guy like Kalijah Cansey should bring some pop to that front seven. Really solid pick at 19. Now, the Buccaneers traded up with the Packers and took Cody Monk in the second round after trading starting right guard Shaq Mason to the Houston Texans this offseason. So this pick makes a lot of sense. Mock played tackle, offensive tackle at North Dakota State. It was kind of hard finding film on him. Some of those small school guys, I, I didn't really get to see a ton of footage from him, but I liked what I saw. A lot of people are kind of viewing him as a guard in the NFL probably doesn't have the ideal size to play tackle at the NFL, but I think he projects as a really good player on the inside. He was dominant in North Dakota State in the gap scheme that they run. He's a strong run blocker. He needs to improve in pass protection, but once again, this is a guy who was really impressive at the Senior Bowl going up a against a lot of big school guys, a lot of guys that were going to go pro. So he really showed out in that setting, and I think that really rose his draft stock. I think it's a solid pick. Now, I really like their third-round pick, defensive end, Yaya Diaby. I think I got that name right. (laughs) From from Louisville. Now, Diaby is a big-time athlete, a three-year starter. He's got good size. He had nine sacks last season. 14 tackles for a loss, so he was a productive player, a disruptor, a guy who can really get after it, get in the backfield, and a guy who was really impressive at the combine. Pro Football Focus had him graded as one of the best run defenders at his position, a very complete player on the edge. He has all the physical gifts to be a high-level NFL player, a guy that really, in a couple years, we might look back and say, man, this guy was a steal in the third round. Now, the other player I wanted to touch on here was Trey Palmer, wide receiver from Nebraska that they took in the sixth round. I think this was a really nice value pick. Trey Palmer, six foot, 192 pounds, ran a 4.3340 yard dash. Now, in this draft, there wasn't a whole lot of guys, or really in most drafts, you're not going to find a whole lot of guys at that size that run a 4340 in the sixth round. I think there's a lot of upside and a lot to like with a guy like Trey Palmer. He's not a very polished route runner. I think he needs to clean that up. 
but he has some really big time upside for a six rounder. I really like what the Bucks did in this draft. I think it was a sneaky good draft by GM Jason Like. I'm gonna give him a B plus, Alex. Yeah, I, I I like what the Bucks did. As you spoke about Kalaji Kansi, hopefully they take that Aaron Donald tag off of him. I think it's completely unfair, though I understand the school that he went to, the size and everything, and the strength he displayed, but he does not project he does not project out that high. But it will be interesting. If they stay in the 4-3, it will be interesting to see him next to Vita Vea as well because Vita Vea commands double teams all the time, and that will free him up to perhaps look like Aaron Donald and if he can win his one-on-one matchups if he, if at the defensive tackle position. So that will be very interesting to see him next to Vita Vea and the type of production that he can put up. I did like Cody Mock. This was one of the, excuse me, one of the offensive linemen that I thought that when I was mentioning before about Atlanta, that I thought Atlanta should have taken instead uh, taken in the second round. That I thought they could have, excuse me, the Panthers could have taken in the second round as opposed to going the, the direction that they went. So I did like him. Yaya Diaby, I do like his size. I do like his speed and everything like that, but I haven't had a chance to look at the tape. But your Trey Palmer point out, I thought that was a very good point out. With Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, and I believe Russell Gage is still there. I believe he's still there. With those three receivers, you now bring in a Trey Palmer who's a burner, which is something that they don't have. Mike Evans can go deep. However, he's not the burner that Trey Palmer is. And if you can scheme things correctly and Baker can read the field correctly, this can be a big-time player. And I mean, and when I say big-time player, I'm thinking more of the things that Ted Ginn Jr. did for Cam Newton, where He's just a deep threat. That he's just solely a deep threat, and he can with those receivers on that team. He should see a lot of one-on-one coverage, no matter where he is on the field, and probably find himself lined up against less skilled safeties that are going to be able to hang with his speed. So I, I do like. I think that's a sneaky good pick in the sixth round. So I, I do like that as well. And I actually I agree with your I agree with your um with your grade specifically when we look at that first round pick and the points I made him standing next to Vita Vea, I am really, truly interested to see. And I'm also interested to see with, I believe Shaquille Barrett had a couple of injuries last year, but if you're putting Vita Vea and you have Kalaje in the middle, and then you have Shaq Barrett on the one end and you put Yaya Diaby on the other end, it'll be real interesting to see what these rookies can do because those two guys in Shaq Barrett and Vita Vea, will 1,000% be commanding double teams, and these guys will have an opportunity to make an immediate impact on the team. These players, they feel like guys that really fit into what the Bucks like to do, what Todd Bowles likes to do, that defensive style, very attacking defense, a very aggressive front seven. I think these type of players really fit that mold, and so I also like it from that standpoint, getting guys that kind of fit your philosophy and your scheme as well. So thought it was a like I said a sneaky good draft by them I think this was a sneaky good episode today that's going to do it for today's episode hope you enjoyed it PGF Nation we'll be back next week with more NFL draft coverage more breakdowns more NFL draft grades before we go I want to give a shout out to my friends at the tailgate foodie for sponsoring today's episode check them out at the tailgatefoodie.com I'm Brad Fowler He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.